number four. And if you do not yet have one of our uh, lessons, of course, it's lesson six, uh, real relationships that we're looking at. We started just a couple of weeks ago. Of course, last week we have the price uh, with us at a bit of a hiatus from our adult Sunday school schedule. And uh, we're picking back up, continuing our second lesson uh, on number six, real relationships in our series on the real church. And so lesson number six, uh, Ephesians chapter four, and we're going to look at verses 14, 15, and 16 in our text here this morning, 14, 15, and 16, look with me uh, in Ephesians chapter four, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, and this is, this is the key here, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. And let's pray together. Lord, I pray as we began this study this morning, Lord, that you would help us to have the kind of relationships you want us to have. Lord, may we understand from Scripture this morning, Lord, that even though we are all flawed, even though we're all sinners, even though there are no perfect people, that, Lord, we can have the right kind of relationships one with another, Lord, there are difficulties, there are struggles. But Lord, I thank you that you've given us a book to teach us how to live, how to have relationships one with another. Lord, especially as we think about the context of the local church. Lord, I pray that you'd bless us this morning. Lord, I pray you'd be with those here, uh, those that are connected via our live stream this morning. Lord, I pray that you would meet the need of every heart. Lord, may you be glorified. And Lord, help us. Lord, to follow your pattern, the biblical pattern, for the kind of relationships that we ought to have. And bless us now and help us in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. If we're to have an authentic life, we're going to have to have authentic relationships. And authentic relationships are sometimes messy. How many of you noticed that the snow is melting? How many of you noticed your yard is muddy? Anybody notice that? Uh, anybody have dogs? Anybody, your dog has found his, their feet muddy and come in your house to get mud in your house. Hallelujah. And uh, my wife is uh, the dog police. Uh, she's downstairs and the dogs get in. She yells at us, wipe the dog's feet off. Why? Because they, they're going to track in that mud. Can I tell you, in relationships, there's going to be some mud. There's going to be some struggles. There, there's going to be some difficulties. Uh, our relationships can be difficult. So how do we maintain love? How, how do we maintain that unity? How do we maintain the right kind of fellowship in the church body with our relationships one with another? And that, that's our focus as we look here as we began a couple weeks ago. And we see in Ephesians 4, verses 14 through 16, uh, we see several things here about our relationships. Ephesians 4 gives us three core, three core truths about the spiritual body of believers, of course, the local church. Three characteristics that we can see in our relationships uh, of a growing Christian. Number one, in verse 14, uh, we see that there is a developing maturity. A developing maturity in verse 14. It says that we henceforth be no, long, be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by sleight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lay in wait to deceive. So we see here that we are to mature. Uh, we're to have some uh, growth, if you will, a developing of maturity. 
Uh, in verse 15 here in our text, we see there's devotional growth. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him all things, which is the head, even Christ. Uh, we're to grow, if you will, uh, and develop a maturity in our life, no longer children, but growing, maturing. But also we're to have that devotion to our Savior, our devotion to the one who died for us and loved, loved us. And then verse 16, uh, we see love demonstrated from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Now, praise the Lord, we have an opportunity, we have the privilege of having a local body, of gathering together a gift from God. Uh, but here's the problem. We are not always... None of us are always walking in love as we ought to. We're not always obeying the Lord as we ought to. Uh, we're not always walking in the Spirit. So, so what do we do? What do we do when there's discord? What do we do when things don't mesh together? What do we do when there's friction? What do we do when there's offenses? What do we do when there's problems? And uh, that's going to be our uh, lesson today. Number one, point number one uh, in our notes this morning, uh, we're going to talk about willful offenders. Willful offenders. The church is made up of real people. Uh, you know, we're not a bunch of mannequins sitting around. I know sometimes we look like it, especially when we're really tired and we've got an hour less sleep and not enough coffee. But we're not mannequins. Uh, we're real people. Uh, we have real problems. And one thing about authentic Christianity is that we grow in our relationship with Him and in our relationship with other believers, and there's some struggles and some growth problems. So point number one is we talk about willful offenders. Uh, and I mentioned this a couple weeks ago. Every one of us have been offended by somebody. We've all had issues. We've all had struggles with some person. We look back in the beginning of Matthew 18, we see the heart of the issue. Matthew 18, verse 1, I believe you have printed in your notes, at the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? The disciples here were so focused on themselves, on lifting themselves up, that they were not focused on one another. They weren't looking at one another, they weren't helping one another, it was all that self-focus. And we see that even with the disciples. Uh, and Jesus set a child in the midst of them and gave them an object lesson in humility. We won't take time to turn there, verses 2 through 5. And after he gave them that object lesson on humility with the child, he warned them. He said in Matthew 18, verse 6, But whoso shall offend one of these little ones, which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and then he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Jesus then told the disciples that although it was inevitable, there was going to be offenses, there were going to be people that willfully might offend them, that we are not to be the one doing that offending. Matthew 18 and verse 7, the next verse, Jesus said, Woe! unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Now, then we learn in the very next couple of verses how we deal with them. How do we deal with willful offenders? How do we deal with those that would offend us? We see that, and you have printed there, Matthew 18, verse 15 through 17, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. So, so what do we do as we talk about our relationships, real relationships, 
Relationships that sometimes get messy. Relationships that sometimes have some problems. Well, what do we do? How do we deal with those issues? What do we do when someone has done something offensive towards us? Uh, point number A there in your notes, acknowledge the offense. Acknowledge the offense. Almost every time when we're confronted with the reality that we're the ones that are to deal with the problem, we who have been offended, we who have been trespassed against, you know, we, we make up a reason. We come up with an excuse. By the way, can I help you? Can I give you the definition of an excuse? The definition of an excuse is the skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. Uh, we make up an excuse as to why we can't do that. You know, I, you know, they'll be offended or uh, they won't listen to me or they don't want me to, whatever the reason. But we have a biblical pattern here that we're to acknowledge the offense. Jesus command here in Matthew chapter 18 is clear. If we can't just move on without dealing with that offense, and sometimes we need to deal with it, then we, the ones who are offended, need to initiate, as the Bible tells us here, uh, we're not to carry offenses, rather we're to deal with them. Uh, we're not to allow them to drive a wedge between our fellowship. Rather, we're to remove them and get them uh, out of the situation, out of the area. I uh, shared the illustration a couple weeks ago about the little league coach who was telling us the little boy on the team, hey, you know we're not supposed to yell. You know we're not supposed to do this. You know we're not. And he went on and on telling this little boy how he ought to act and what sportsmanship was like. And the little boy's like, I know, I know, I know, I know. He said, yes, sir, I, I believe that. And finally, at the end, he said, okay, I want you to go tell your mother what I just told you. You know, sometimes uh, we as older folks, uh, we struggle a little more even than those that are younger in our relationships not being what they ought to be. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I believe you have printed there in verse 1, Dare any of you have any matter against another to go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. First, Christ instructs us in Matthew 18 to resolve these offenses within the assembly of believers. Uh, when it comes to personal difficulties in the church, there's no higher court than the local church, according to God's plan and God's purpose. Uh, one of the most damaging things you can do for your testimony, one of the most damaging things you can do for the testimony of others, one of the most damaging things you can do for the testimony of the church is to air your dirty laundry, uh, your grievances one with another uh, publicly. Rather, God, God has a plan and a purpose for us to deal with those that offend us, uh, to go to them, uh, to go to right that offense. Uh, Jay Adams, a counselor, an author, wrote, Jesus won't allow the unreconciled condition to continue among believers. In Matthew 5, if another considers you to have wronged him, Jesus says that you must go to him. In Matthew 18, he says that if the other person has done something wrong to you, you must go to him. There's never a time when you can sit and wait for your brother to come to you. And Jesus doesn't allow for that. He gives no opportunity for that. It's always your obligation. It's always my obligation to go. To initiate. Uh, you know, maybe you've been mistreated. Maybe someone's offended you or a family member. God wants us to deal with that one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. For what purpose? Well, I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. I can't give anybody a piece of my mind. I don't have enough left. I won't have any left. Uh, that's not God's purpose for us going to that other person. It's not so you can get it off your chest. It's not so I can tell them off. Rather, it's so we can remedy, so we can fix, so we can heal the situation. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 21, the Bible says, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. So we said that point A there, uh, that we're to acknowledge the offense. Point number B in your notes, we're not only to acknowledge, but also we're to do more than that. We're to approach the offender. 
approach the offender. Uh, God gives us three possible steps. I'm going to hurry through this. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. Uh, Matthew 18 and verse 15, we see first of all, he tells us to go one-on-one. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Now the verse spells that out here. First, I'm to go by myself to that one who has offended me to try to have try to deal with the situation, try to rectify the offense. Number two, uh, and by the way, before we get to that, let me, let me make sure we, we're on the same page here and we're looking uh, from the right aspect and the right purpose. Uh, we have to go in love. Uh, John 15, verse 12, this is my commandment that you love one another. Uh, not on the attitude of hatefulness or spitefulness, but the attitude of love. Ephesians 4, 15, but speaking, speaking the truth in love in love, uh, may grow up unto him in all things, verse 15 here in our text, which is the head, even Christ. And by the way, if I'm going to someone alone, that means no one else needs to know about it. I don't need to call Ramon up and say, hey, Ramon, you're not going to believe what Terry did to me. I'm going to go talk to him about it. But you pray for me as I go chew him out. That, that's not the purpose. That, that's not God's plan. Uh, no one should even know. Why? Because God gives us a pattern here uh, to go to that one. Uh, I gave you these a couple weeks ago, but I'll give them to you quickly in case you missed them. The seven A's of confession. Uh, keep these in mind when someone approaches you with an offense they felt from you. Uh, number one, address everyone involved and only them. Number two, avoid it. A- avoid the words if, but, and maybe. The words are just blaming the other party, finding fault. Number three, admit specifically what you did when possible. Number four, apologize. Express your sorrow for your sin. Number five, ask forgiveness. You know, most of the time we leave that out, but we're we're to do so. Number six, accept the consequences. Make restitution if you can. Don't demand that others pretend nothing happened. Number seven, alter your behavior. You won't be perfect, but we ought to be getting better. Uh... You know, sometimes, though, that going to that person individually is not successful. And God gives us another, uh, another plan here, Matthew 18, verse 16. Yeah, printer there in your notes, but if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. You know, in some cases of sinful behavior or compromise, uh, which you've already personally addressed with the right spirit, you may need to move to another step. It may be that there's no res- resolution with that one-on-one. You know, and God tells us here the progression is we're to take one or two people with us and go and attempt again. Second Corinthians 13, 1, If the third time I'm coming to you in the mouth of two or three witnesses, shall every word be established. Uh, And then finally, if that's still no resolution, the Bible says the third step is to take it to the church, Matthew 18, 17. And if he should neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. You know, most instances, offenses against you, against me, can be dealt with uh, quickly, can be dealt with concisely, can be dealt with one-on-one, but sometimes... Uh, there's escalation, there's problems that are not easily resolved, and sometimes the party wants no resolution because of a heart of sin, because of a, a wrong attitude. Now, this pattern here is not to cause harm to that one who has offended. Rather, it's to bring them back. Rather, it's to encourage them back into fellowship. Rather, it's to a resolve and to fix the situation. First Corinthians 5.11 But now have I written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such and one know not to eat for what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without God judges therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Every step, every step of that process, we need to remember and realize that the purpose 
is restitution. The purpose is to get that relationship back together. The purpose is to, to bond it back together. How, how many of you like duct tape? I, I praise God for duct tape. Yesterday I had to use it. Uh, the window in my car came off the track when it was 30 below uh, about a month ago. How many of you remember that? It was 30 below just not long ago. And the window came off the track. I go to put my window down in my car and it would get all cockeyed and have to take two people to hold it to get it to go back up. And yesterday as I was driving, uh, I had about a 35-minute drive, about five minutes into my drive back home. The window dropped down. I went to try to fix it. The whole window whipped out like it was a wing. Uh, looked like some kind of uh, Italian sports car door ready to open. And I'm driving down the highway. By the way, if you saw a crazy man driving a Volvo holding a window like this out the window yesterday in the Hyundai, that was me. And I got home, and I'm, okay, I guess I have to fix it now. The window was completely loose, Jim. I mean, I could just pick the window out. If I not, hadn't grabbed it, it would be somewhere on the highway. And I had to take things apart, had to tear the, the stuff that seals the inside of the door apart. When I was done, my, before I put it back together, I went and got hillbilly chrome, otherwise known as duct tape, and taped all the, the lining back together, got it all sealed up. Uh, I had to patch it back together. The goal is to patch the relationship back together. That's In every step, that's always the goal. It stays the goal. It's to bring those relationships back where God wants them to be. And uh, we need to realize that's the plan. Number two, point number two in your notes, and we'll go forward here. We talked about willful offenders. Point number two, wayward, wayward brothers. Wayward brothers. On one hand, we have an offending brother, one that has done or said something offensive against you. On the other hand, we have a wayward brother. That's one who's walked away from the Lord, from his church. And as a Christian, as a believer, what do I do? How do I deal with that person in the right relationship in the church? In, in Galatians chapter 6, and you have printed there in your notes, Galatians 6 uh, provides the answer for us. Galatians 6 verses 1 and 2. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, kick him in the teeth. doesn't say that, does it, Ramon? That's what we want it to say. That's how we act sometimes. It says, ye which are spiritual, restore. Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Notice this, and this is vital. Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. In other words, the Bible tells us when someone's taken in a fault, you need to realize that could be you. Realize that you have the same capacity, you have the same weakness, we have the same frailty, uh, and it could just as have easily been you. And we're to restore and help, not in a sense of judgment, not in a sense of I'm better than you, but rather in a sense of, hey, I've been there. Hey, I've I, I, I've done the same thing. Let me help you. Let me encourage you. We see that picture there. Uh, so what do we do? What is God's plan for wayward brothers? Point number A. Point number A. Restore them. Restore them. Spiritual, get this statement, spiritual casualties are a reality because we have a real enemy. Spiritual casualties are a reality because we have a real enemy. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Satan is ever on the prowl, uh, ever seeking. Uh, the phrase there in our text we saw in Galatians overtaken in a fault it is a description is a picture of Satan's attack 
To overtake means to be overwhelmed by. To be caught in. I saw a video a day or two ago that was one of the most unusual things I've seen in a long time. It was somewhere in Africa, and there were some folks that were hunting some sort of wild pig. I don't know what kind of wild pig it was. It wasn't a, a warthog, some sort of wild pig. And they were hunting them with monkeys. It was the weirdest, strangest video you'd ever see. And they had these little monkeys, and they snuck up on the pigs, and they threw the monkeys at the pigs. Now, don't worry, the pigs didn't eat the monkeys. The monkeys chased the pigs, jumped on the pigs' backs, and rode the pigs. There was no explanation with the video. I'm just watching this like, what in the world is going on? And there's these little monkeys riding the backs of these pigs, and the pigs are gone. And all I can figure is that because the monkeys are on their back, it slowed them down. And these folks hunting the pigs, they had nets, and they, they kind of circled them, and the monkeys were riding them, and it was insane. And finally, they threw a net, and the monkey jumped off, and they trapped the pig. And I say all that to say the Internet is very weird. And, but I watched that video of, uh, of that pig being captured. Why? Because a little monkey ran up, it jumped on his back, rode it around, slowed it down till somebody caught it in a trap. It was overtaken. Can I tell you, oftentimes the devil uses small, insignificant things like those little monkeys to overtake us in a fault. And oftentimes we who are overtaken go, how is that possible? How could something so small cause such a big problem. But we see that picture of being overtaken. You know, there's no one here immune. Nobody has an immunity to the traps of Satan. You know, when we're in the midst of sin and problems in our life, we look around and say, hey, I wish I was like that brother. I wish I was like her. I wish I didn't have to deal with sin like they don't have to deal with sin. But that's a lie from the devil. We all have to deal with it. None of us have an immunity. We all have that propensity to be overtaken in a fault. Hebrews 12, verse 1, we see our job is to acknowledge the sin and help lift them out of the ditch. Wherefore, seeing we are all compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run the race with patience. Run with patience the race that is set before us. I used to have a little... Uh, Bronco 2. Miss Lois, do you remember my Bronco 2? And it was a unique vehicle. Uh, I drove it for two months without a starter. It was a manual transmission. And uh, I would just push start it until one day I had trouble. But it was, uh, I, I was driving it one time in the winter. I was driving on a road, uh, Bouchard Lake Road, Dusty knows where it is, uh, north of uh, Clyde Corner. Some of you know that area, north of Edmonton. And I was driving across this washboard road, and I had went and got junkyard parts to build a lift kit for it because I was too cheap to buy the right stuff. And I had the front springs were out of a Ford F-150 gym. They were way too stiff for a little Bronco too. The rear springs were out of a Ford Explorer, way too stiff for a Bronco too. So it, it, it rode pretty hard. And I was driving on this washboard road with ice on it. And eventually, instead of going down the road, I launched off the road. Me and the guy with me, we went airborne, literally airborne. And we dropped at least the height of the ceiling down off the road surface. We went through, I don't know how many willow bushes, until finally we stopped at the bottom. And I looked over at my buddy Joel, and I said, Joel, it wasn't, it wasn't your brother. Uh, I said, Joel, you Okay. He said, yeah, are you okay? I said, yeah. And then he said, is, is the truck okay? I said, I don't know. We got out. It was okay. But we couldn't get out of there. I mean, we were, we launched. <laughs> we were way off the road. So I got my phone. I called a friend of mine who lived in Vimy. 
His name is Jerry. I called Jerry up. Jerry's about my dad's age. I said, Jerry, I need some help. He said, what did you do, Brian? I said, well, I said, I was on Bouchard Lake Road. And I said, me and Joel launched the vehicle off the road. And he laughed. He made fun of me for a little bit. I'm not recommending you do that. But about a half an hour later, he showed up. He had a winch. And we ran the winch cable down to my little Bronco. And we hooked the winch cable. And he pulled us back onto the road surface. He got us back. Christian, our job when it comes to wayward brothers is to go around with our winch cable. Not to yell at them, not to say, I told you so, but rather to, hey, let me help you. Let, let, me, let me pull you back. Let me help you get back to where God wants you to be. And we see that picture here in the scriptures. Uh, you know, instead of saying, hey, yeah, I knew you'd do that. I knew you'd fail. Say, hey, can I help you? Every time I see somebody stuck on the side of the road, every time I see somebody in a ditch, I, I always think, man, I've got to help them. Why? I've been there. I know what it is to sit and wait on the side of a highway. I know what it is to be stuck in the ditch. I know what it is to have a problem. I, I want to, man, I've got to help. Christian, every one of you know what it is to be stuck, to be overcome, and overtaken by Satan. And we don't like to admit it. We don't like to broadcast it, but we all know. And we know what it is for someone to encourage us and to help us. God wants us to be that encouraging, that helping, that anchor line, that winch line to help someone else. So I said, point number A, in our notes here, we're to restore them. Point number B, not only restore them, but reinforce, reinforce them. After someone has repented and is restored to fellowship in the church, they need special reinforcement. Special reinforcement. That's why in Galatians 6 and verse 2, it says, Bear ye one another's burdens. I don't think I need to even make this statement because all of us understand it, but I want to make sure we articulate it and, and, and understand it. Sin brings burdens, burdensome consequences into our lives. It, even after we get back, after we get out of the ditch, sometimes there's some consequences. You know, that Bronco was driving home a few hours later, but I was missing some plastic from the front of it. You know why? Because it was, it was broken by willow trees. I had, I had some consequences. And sometimes our life after restoration, there's some consequences. There's some brokenness. There's some pain. Uh, there's some burdens that we carry. And Scripture points out that while suffering may come as a result of persecution in the name of Christ, some suffering is a result of our own sin. Sometimes the suffering that we endure, it's a consequence of our past, a consequence of some brokenness. 1 Peter 4, verse 14, I believe you have printed there in verse 15, If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the Spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evil do doer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. By the way, if a believer, if a believer, if a Christian brother or sister in Christ reverts back to some sins and habits and struggles of the old life, can I tell you, it may alter some health, it may alter uh, our mental state, it may alter uh, some other things in our life. That's why it's important that as believers, we try to help restore 
as the Bible says, such a one. You know, the consequences of a wayward season of life can be pretty heavy. My wife had a Pontiac 6000 car when we got married. And a year or so into our marriage, I'm not sure how long, we decided to sell it. We sold it to a friend of mine. Matter of fact, uh, uh, the, the friend that I pray, prayed for, we prayed for that had pneumonia in hospital that almost died uh, about two months ago. Uh, he's the fellow that had bought it from me. And he, he bought the car or was buying the car. And I'm not sure why he thought this was a good idea, but he parked it in a very sketchy area. He left it unlocked in a very sketchy area. And he left the keys in it. I don't recommend that. And amazingly, somebody stole it. It was eventually found. When it was found, there was not much left of it. How many have ever heard the phrase, drive it like you stole it? You ever heard that phrase before? I know why they say that phrase. Because they drove it like they stole it. That car was completely inoperable when they found that car. It was, it was ruined. One night, one trip by some group of folks destroyed it. There was some serious damage, irreparable damage. And by the way, sometimes when we get wayward with God, we cause some irreparable damage. Not eternally, but physically. Sometimes we cause some, some hurt that will never truly go away. But I praise God that even though we can have that hurt, I praise God that we can be encouraged in the fact that the love of God never changes. His grace is all sufficient. And how wonderful it is that as believers we can have a part in encouraging those who are discouraged, encouraging those who are struggling, encouraging those who are wayward. Romans 15 verse 1, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let me share an illustration with you. In 1961, how many of you were alive in 1961? How many of you remember that year? Brother Ramon, you remember 1961? Uh, my first car and my first house were made in 1961. Uh, I had a 1961 trailer, 1961 Ford car. It was a good year. But in 1961, Jean Nitek invited six friends over to her home in New York City. They all had one thing in common. They all wanted to lose weight. And Jean herself had been working to follow a diet regimen prescribed by her doctor, but she was struggling to lose the last 50 pounds that he recommended her to lose. These seven ladies, her and her six friends, began to meet weekly, began to encourage one another in their goals, slowly but surely. The pounds came off. And small victories were won. Today, that group that Jean started with six friends in 1961 has grown from seven people to over a million. It's now known simply as Weight Watchers. Someone once asked her, asked Jean, why she was able to help so many people take control of their lives. She related that when she was a teenager, she used to walk through a park where she saw mothers standing around talking while their children sat on swings with no one to push them. Well, imagine today with cell phones, that becomes times ten. Jean said she would give them a push and then watch as that one little push would get them pumping their own legs back and forth. Pretty soon, she said, they'd be swinging all on their own. She said, that's what my role in life is. I'm there to give others a push. Christian, 
our job as believers, as brothers and sisters in Christ, ought to be to be there to give that push or that pull that's needed. You know, even when people commit egregious sin, praise God. God is a forgiving God. And God renews that fellowship when we turn to Him in repentance. Yet Christians, wayward brothers and sisters in Christ, need someone to come alongside, to encourage, to help, uh, to go in meekness and kindness, and to help them. Now we have those that offend us and cause us problems. God gives us a way to deal with that. The last portion of going to that person, to we see them going away. But the purpose is not, okay, you stay away, you stay over there. The purpose is, hey, let's go get them. Let's encourage them back. Let's lift them. Let's get them back on course, get them back on path. When Rebecca was 12 or 13, she and I were out hunting. And I had an old, really, really old ATV. And we got stuck and we got out of the mud and there was mud everywhere. And I told Rebecca, I said, here, just stand over here. I'm going to drive around in the grass. And I'm going to try to let the grass take some of the mud off our machine. Then I'll have you get back on and we'll head back. So I started driving around in circles in this tall grass, trying to throw the mud off the tires, trying to let the broom grass clean off the quad. The grass was about this tall. What I didn't realize is in the middle of that grass that was about this tall was a rock that was about this tall. And as I was going around and around and around and around and around, at one point, I hit that rock. And Rebecca's watching from a distance as she watched what she thought was her father die. As I began to roll, it was me and quad, me and quad, me and quad, me and quad, and I just rolled that thing. And I'm going to tell you right now, it hurt. If you've ever been rolled on by a quad several times, it doesn't feel good. But I was afraid, and I landed upside down. By the way, you always land upside down. I don't know why that is, always. But I was upside down, quads on top of me, and all I could think of was my daughter is watching, and she thinks I'm dead. So I crawled out from under it as fast as I could in pain. One of my arms was laying over there. Uh, I think my eyeball was gouged out. No, I, w I was hurting. But I got up as fast as I could, and I said, I'm okay. No, I wasn't okay, but I said that. And then I went to look at our quad. Jim, it wasn't okay. The chain was off. I mean, it was not okay. And we were 15 miles at least from our vehicle. At least. And it was so wet and muddy. It was the kind of mud where if you start walking in about five steps, your feet weigh 50 pounds. You ever walked in that kind of mud? I could have made it back to the truck if I had a 12-year-old girl with me. I'd have had to carry her on my head. I didn't want to carry her on my head. I, so I spent a while patching that vehicle back together. Why? We needed to use it. We needed to get back where we we're supposed to go. It took, it took a while. I got pretty dirty. I got real dirty. I got mud all over me head to toe. I already had blood all over me, head to toe. I got grease all over me. I, it was a mess. But we got it back together. We were able to get back on and ride back to the truck. That messiness, that dirtiness, that labor was worth it. Why? Because we got a vehicle back in service. How much more important how much more eternally vital is a life? A life that matters everything to their God. Christian, we need to be willing to get our hands dirty. We need to be willing to get down in the mud and to help somebody and to get them where God wants them to be.
as we have the right kind of relationships God wants us to have. Let's pray together. Lord, I pray you'd help us. Lord, we, we talked about a couple weeks ago and today a little bit about those that offend us. But Lord, how often do we, by our actions, by our lack of concern, by our judgmentalness, offend those who are struggling, who are hurting, who need someone to help them up, not push them down. Lord, I pray that we would follow your pattern. I pray that we'd love one another. I pray we'd be looking for ways to lift up, to encourage. Lord, even when it involves us getting dirty, even when it involves us getting down to laboring for the benefit of someone else, Lord, may we do so in love. Lord, bless us now. Lord, I pray you be with us as we continue our services this morning. Lord, I pray you be with us in our service to come, be with those traveling yet to be here. Lord, may you be glorified. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless.